Welcome again to Pilot Kimberley. I hope you're all doing well in these current circumstances with COVID-19 and so on. I thought I'd take the opportunity to update you on where I'm at and also to talk to you about um, a couple of subjects that have come up in my uh, online life, if you like. So back to COVID-19 and its impact on, uh, on learning to fly. For me, the impact has been quite substantial. I haven't worked since uh, middle of February. That has meant that uh, my finances have become completely depleted, all of my savings and so on, and, and my budget for flying now is actually non-existent. And given that I've applied for nearly 3,400 jobs unsuccessfully, despite my quite impressive CV, I'm uh, in a situation where I'm having to rethink exactly what I'm going to do for the future and that includes with my flying. It is my intention to continue to uh, finish off my PPL. I have my exam uh, booked for uh, a couple of weeks away and I've moved that date. Uh, CASA had cancelled it anyway due to some kind of IT update. So I've moved the date till sometime in October to do that exam. I've already done my RPL exam. But the biggest impact will be on my actual flight training. And, and that's going to be significant because it means that I was just at the point where, you know, I was ready to do a couple of things before going uh, solo for the second time in my life. And uh, <clears throat> this is going to mean that I won't be able to do that. And that will probably mean several more hours of flight training before I get back those sort of the feel and so on that's required to um, to fly the tail dragger well enough to give myself an opportunity at solo. Uh, so I hope uh, it's going well for everybody else and I hope that you're not um, having to do the sorts of things that I'm having to do. Um, so if there's anyone out there who uh, has a role for a project manager or a change analyst, change manager, business analyst or anything like that, um, please let me know. I'm more than happy to apply for a role and uh, see where I can get. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this channel because that helps me get uh, um, more people watching, which means that I have a chance to get sponsors, which means that not all of the costs of operating comes out of my pocket. Also, check out the merchandise on uh, the sister channel, Soaring Sisters. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, merchandise there. Just go to www.soaring-sisters.com and check out the merchandise there in the store. Uh, also, there's a Pilot Kimberley Patreon page and for the price of a cup of coffee per month, you can uh, support this channel. So that's an update on my situation. I won't be able to do any flying for some time until I get a job at least. And uh, also, I wanted to talk to you all about a couple of things that have been coming up in the um, Facebook groups and so forth. And one in particular was uh, visiting a subject that I've encountered in another online, uh, another YouTube channel, which refers to, um, you know, a minimum maneuvering speed and so forth. <clears throat> and quite unfortunately, this post featured a YouTube page that warned of being careful of stalls or warned of, you know, tried to, it sounded like it was scaring people away from, uh, from ever getting close to a stall. Now, while I actually, you know, agree that you don't want to be close to a stall uh, when you don't intend to be, the stall and the, even the spin for many aircraft is actually part of the flight envelope. That's the things meant to do this. Um, and practicing stalls and spins, while there are many who would debate that that's not a good thing to do because um, it doesn't really teach you anything. Um, you know, I'll leave that debate aside. There are, there are, except to say there are a number of people who say that, you know, too much of the stall and spin training concentrates on getting the aircraft into the stall and spin situation rather than concentrating on getting it out. I won't enter into that debate really it's not worth talking about as far as I'm concerned. As a glider pilot and as a chief flying instructor in gliding 
I've done more stalls and spins than I can count in instruction. And I will tell you absolutely, beyond a doubt, that the, the uh, concentration on aspects of stalling and spinning and the flight uh, envelope, if you like, the, uh, the situation that leads to the stall and spin has reduced gliding uh, accidents very significantly. There was a period of time in gliding when I first started and that back in the 70s and 80s when pilots were being routinely killed by spinning in. And the, the approach that was taken was twofold. One was to teach recovery from stalls and spins and also to teach uh, pilots to recognize the situations where they might uh, inadvertently enter a stall spin situation and I'll talk about that a bit more but more importantly it focused on what is now very commonly being referred to in, on the social media groups as uh, minimum maneuvering speeds now in gliding we've never called it that uh, we and maybe it's because we don't want to get it confused with uh, maneuvering speed which is you know the speed at which uh, a certain level of uh, control inputs uh, shouldn't be used and so forth or you know rough airspeed uh, we've always referred to it as safe speed near the ground and I think that's a really good way to refer to it uh, those of you ha who are familiar with the you know effect of uh, load and therefore G on um, stalling speed would know that uh, the stalling speed uh, increases with the square root of the G load. So what that means is in a 60 degree uh, bank turn, which is a 2G turn, your stalling speed is 1.4 times the, the uh, stalling speed of the aircraft in its um, non-turning configuration, if you like, when it's flying level. Uh, so it makes sense that if you fly at faster than 1.4 VS and you don't do anything silly um, with you know stupid control inputs then you should be safe and so in gliding what is taught is that whenever you are near the ground so circuits uh, any time that you are trying to get away as often happens in cross-country flights from a, a, a level at which you haven't yet committed to circuit but might be about to do so. Typically anything you know close to circuit height, 1000 feet AGL or thereabouts, and some of us even take it up to about you know 2000 AGL, we will fly at 1.5 VS and that is drilled into us from day one. From the very first time we get in the glider we're expected to learn the concept of safe speed near the ground 1.5 vs whenever you are at circuit height 1.5 vs whenever you're um, turning at low altitudes so trying to get away in a, in, a, in a weak thermal close to the ground say and we're also taught another thing which um, might seem odd to powered pilots but to gliding it makes a lot of sense because we are doing lots of off-field landings. If we're really trying to fly cross-country, genuinely trying to fly cross-country, which we do in the, in the latter part of our skills development, then we are pushing ourselves to the, if you like, the performance limits, not the safety limits, our competitive limits, our racing limits, or our cross-country uh, capability limits, um, so that we can, you know, learn how to get the maximum performance out of the glider in terms of uh, how far we can fly in a given time. Bear in mind that all cross-country flight and gliding requires you to find a thermal, which location unknown, they're not visible, requires you to set yourself up in that, term, that thermal and climb away. And then you glide between that thermal and the next, and if you're smart, you're always looking for the best air so that your sink speed is less than the design sink speed so you're looking for air that perhaps is maybe not sinking as fast or rising a little tiny bit but not enough to circle in and that is the key to cross-country flying now if you find yourself 
getting close to the point where you have to land out, as we call it, land in a paddock somewhere, then you need to be um, watching that all the time. We're always playing this constant game of, uh, you know, balancing the the performance risk against the safety risk. And what I mean by that is we're always trying to go faster, go further, but we're always conscious that if I make a go faster, go further decision, will that put me in a position where I have fewer options and therefore make it less safe? And how do I manage those options? Uh, we never want to find ourselves low with nowhere to land or low with only one place to land. That's There are many times pilots, and myself included, have been caught out by having just a single option or, you know, committing to a single option when we should not have and finding that option was less than perfect. I've landed on uh, two uh, wheel tracks in high grass in a glider, not recommended. Um, I've landed uh, at an airfield in which had I not taken the time to inspect it really carefully I would not have seen that somebody had closed the airfield forever, a council had closed the airfield, not put any markers on it to say that it was closed and put a five strand barbed wire fence across the middle of it. I happened to be flying a 500 kilometer a triangle uh, with a friend and she was about 10 k's ahead of me and she I heard her outland at this particular airfield which I won't name and I also heard another pilot was outlanding somewhere else and another pilot looked like they were going to outland at that very same airfield I knew that I was going to have to outland the day was closing down very rapidly due to a storm I had to fly about 50 kilometers in which I didn't find any lift at all except little bubbles and I arrived at that airfield with sufficient height to have a really good look at it about three or four times by circling in what appeared to be perhaps potentially a thermal going to form. <clears throat> the thermal didn't form. I uh, got a really good look at the airfield though and I could see this glider on the far end of it, or let's uh, say the eastern end of it, and I was on the western end uh, circling above. And I looked again and I thought, wow she's actually gone over the top of the fence and she told me later she hadn't seen the fence until she was really close to it and had to close the brakes and go over it so uh, anyway I had time to spot the fence and land so we're constantly balancing that you know if I push on to what looks like a safe out landing what if it's not a safe out landing so that means that then we're also finding ourselves often in times in places like I just described where we are low we have not yet committed to circuit and we are having to circle in iffy kind of conditions iffy lift and if there's any kind of a wind uh, somewhere in that circle we will experience the kind of um, skidding that powered pilots are warned against on base and final turns. We're, remember, we're doing constant circles, so we're not doing a single 90 degree turn here or there. We're constantly circling, so somewhere in that circle we will encounter the conditions which uh, give you the perception that you're not turning enough and you push too much rudder with not enough bank and you spin in. So the only way to deal with that is to fly at a speed where you're not close to the stalling speed. So whenever we find ourselves in those positions, you know, let's say we're 1200 feet AGL and we're circling and there's a wind, we need to be flying at 1.5 VS. And that's what we're taught, we just religiously do it. The other thing, as I said, that we're taught and which I've kind of taken a little while to get around to is once you make the decision to commit to circuit and for us circuit means you know I'm doing a circuit on that paddock um, you know we work out we've got a, a checklist that we run through um, to check that the paddock is suitable to land in things like surface stock slope swirl lines um, you know all those kinds of things 
and we once we've decided on which paddock we're going to land in <clears throat> we actually commit to a circuit on that paddock we don't just you know fly into it um, not if we're smart anyway so point is once we say that's it I'm out landing that means that's it I'm out landing if we then run into a super good thermal tough luck right don't care if you've got a hundred kilometers to fly to get home don't care if you've got 500 kilometers to fly to get home once you've committed to circuit in that paddock I'm sorry don't care how good the thermal is you're landing and we are taught to make that decision so I find it really really interesting that in these groups people are talking about you know beware the stall yeah you know I was about to say something kind of offensive but no surprises there Sherlock shall we say yeah beware the stall but don't frighten people away from you know uh, training in the stall whether you think it's a good thing or it's not a good thing somewhere in your training someone's going to teach you to do stalls and if you're sending out a message in YouTube to say be scared of the stall be scared of the spin then you're going to affect people's abilities to un to take in the appropriate training so whether you agree that spin training should or should not be done or stall training should or should not be done uh, is kind of irrelevant it is done and um, making people scared of it is counterproductive so I had my little say about that so what I thought I would also concentrate on is revisiting that subject that I visited in a, a video a little while ago about why all power pilots should first take up gliding and you might remember in my last video I spoke about five things to, to accelerate your learning and one of the first I said was get your A, B and C certificates in gliding first and uh, I absolutely stand by that I totally do um, go back and have a look at that video if you haven't seen it but basically it makes financial sense as well because some of the fundamental flying skills the stick and rudder stuff that you're learning at 300 odd dollars an hour you could be learning at you know basically something close to you know an eighth of the price or something like that so um, it makes good financial sense <clears throat> but the other thing is gliding really teaches you a bunch of incredibly useful skills that you simply don't learn in powered flight you just don't learn them and and one of them that you know that commercial pilots learn and a regular passenger transport pilots learn and so on is this notion of uh, what they call uh, a minimum maneuvering speed or what we call safe speed near the ground the other thing that's really uh, good in gliding if you like um, is uh, how we learn to use rudder now there's a kind of standing joke amongst glider pilots that um, in uh, in powered planes the uh, rudder pedals are somewhere to rest your feet um, because you know power pilots tend not to use the rudder very much now I know that's not totally true and I know that if you fly a tail dragger well you are probably <laughs> very used to using the rudder but you don't use it anywhere like we use it in, in gliding and uh, so much so that little ball thing that that is just com would be completely useless in a glider absolutely totally useless I've had one in my glider but uh, you know it was a 1959 design glider it's just not sensitive enough so why is it that gliders have such need for rudder in a glider the the thing is just basically tuned for performance uh, the way that we get these you know 40 to 1 60 to 1 glide ratios is by you know minimizing the drag and in particular the uh, induced drag so what we have is extremely high aspect ratio wings often with winglets on them to make them even more high aspect so you know we're talking about an incredibly thin wing in terms of its um, its cord length and an incredibly thin wing, wing often in terms of its actual cord and uh, incredibly long up to 29 meters in length in fact so 
you know, when you put an aileron out at the end of a 15, 16, 17, 20, 29 meter long wing, you've got a very long moment or very long leverage. So the drag that you induce by increasing the lift when you force the aileron down actually causes that wing to move backwards. But that's the wing that you want to move forwards. And this is known as adverse yaw. You don't see it terribly much in most aircraft. And if, it, if the aircraft tended to suffer from it, it's fairly easy to tune it out. Not so in a glider. It's very difficult and, and you wouldn't want to. You would waste, be wasting energy by inducing even more drag. Uh, parasitic drag in this case. So what what you need instead is rudder. So if we fly our glider along steadily, straight and level, and we take the stick and we bump it without putting any uh, aileron control in, we can really see the adverse yaw quite clearly. You bump the stick to the left, the nose goes right. You bump the stick to the right, the nose goes left. So you're kind of almost leading with rudder when you're flying a glider. It's really important for a number of reasons. One uh, is to deal with that adverse yaw uh, because you need to fly efficiently in a glider if you want to get the best performance in terms of cross-country time and distance. But also, getting back to that stall spin situation, if you are low, close to the ground and you don't do a coordinated turn, you're much more likely to have um, the, uh, the inside wing uh, stall and therefore spin. So using the rudder is incredibly important. Uh, so you'll find the rudder pedals are very soft to use. They actually move very readily and you're finding that you're just constantly working them. And our instrument to provide us the information about when when, when and how, well not when, but more, how much rudder we need to use at any given instant is actually the least costly uh, aviation instrument known to man. It's a piece of wool, usually red wool, stuck to the outside of the canopy in the absolute center of the canopy. That piece of wool will move sideways with the, with the airflow. So with our peripheral vision, when we're turning, we can keep that piece of wool straight just by pushing rudder pedal. Now, when you first learn to fly, it's difficult, but you know, as you get more proficient, it's just second nature. You're able to do it. Much like uh, those of you who are used to flying tail draggers will know how you can feel, um, particularly chart tail draggers, but all aircraft, you know how you can feel when the turn is out of balance. You don't really need to see the ball. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, next episode, I'm going to bring you lots of uh, footage and lots of information about gliding. Um, because I won't be doing any powered flying, it's a great opportunity for you all to learn, you know, how do we get in the air, what sort of flying do we do, uh, what's this gliding stuff actually really all about. But for now, that's all from Pilot Kimberly. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell notification, and... Give us a thumbs up. I'm Kimberly Olsen. Bye for now.